And I want to say welcome uh, and good evening to everyone who's here or depending where you're coming from, uh, good night or good morning. Um, my name is Brendan McCormack. I'm uh, an instructor and a recent PhD graduate uh, in the English department at UBC, and I'm an assistant editor at Canadian Literature. And on behalf of the journal, uh, in particular, our editor, Christine Kim, uh, our managing editor, Donna Chin, and our marketing assistant, Neve Harold, uh, whose hard work and, and planning really helped make this event possible. It's, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you all to Verse Forward, Poetry on the Front Lines, which is the first event in uh, what we at the journal hope will evolve into an ongoing uh, ongoing series of, of readings that might help to maintain uh, the connections of our various literary communities in these uh, most distant and, and challenging times. Um, we're th we're, and we're thrilled that so many of you have taken the time to, to join us in this new venture for the journal. I'm joining you from my home in East Vancouver, uh, in, in my daughter's bedroom, which has become one of my makeshift offices these last several months. And um, uh, well, I know just from seeing so many familiar names uh, here on Zoom, this virtual room is filled with folks from all over Canada and beyond. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that the home of Canadian literature and our offices at UBC are on the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Musqueam people. And I would like uh, to express our generosity to the nation and the community for their generosity that makes all the work that we undertake at UBC possible. And this event is uh, in many ways the brainchild of our poetry editor, Pinder Dulai. And in a moment, I'll, I'll pass the mic over to Pinder who will be our MC and will introduce you to the fabulous panel of poets that we're very honored to have speaking here tonight. Thank you, Brendan. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for making the time to be part of this reading event. Um, I'm just going to read something that uh, kind of speaks to Verse Forward. So why did we put Verse Forward reading series together? Verse Forward reading series seeks to sustain literary community by amplifying Canadian poetry's ongoing vitality on the front lines as we interrogate and imagine anew the conditions and locations we inhabit. The inaugural event in the series features a diverse panel of both established and emerging voices, uh, speaking on themes of home, race, identity, and the environments we live in. The original poems presented at the reading will be published in an upcoming issue of Canadian Literature, issue number 242. So just as MC, I just want to acknowledge also, I'm, uh, I'm actually MCing from the unceded traditional territories of the Kwantlen, the Samiyamu, and the Katsi Reserve First Nations. Uh, I'm truly um, uh, humbled to be able to live in this area, now, now known in its colonial name as Surrey, and um, it's a community that I'm part of. So we'll begin, but before I just wanted to say thank you to um, the Canadian literature staff. Um, that's Neem Harold, Brandon McCormack, Janin Vilatsa, Jijun Wu, Christine Kim, and Donna Chin for all of their hard work in taking, uh, taking care of putting this event together. So our first reader up is Kevin Spenced. Kevin Spenced is the author of Ignite, Jabbering with Bing Bong, and Hearts Amok, a memoir in verse, all published by Anvil Press. And he's also the author of over a dozen chapbooks. He teaches creative writing at Vancouver Community College and lives in the Vancouver on the unceded Coast Salish Territory with his love of his life, Shona Kendo. So uh, Kevin, I'll just hand this over to you. Thank you, thank you, Pinder. And thank you everybody at um, Canadian Literature for um, having, having me and setting this up. And I'm so excited to be reading with um, so many amazing people tonight. I'm gonna start um, with my first poem, which will be in Canadian Literature 2021, the first issue of next year. And um, again, Pinder, thank you for asking for this. It's a poem that I wrote two years, a year and a half ago at the Kagawa House. And I was reading at the time a book of poetry called Lady by Kim Trainer, And she looks at history and um, the violence of history 
um, in a particular region north of the Caucasus um, um, Mountains, which happens to be where my um, mother's father was born, my grandfather. And um, it was a, a very violent time um, during his life. And um, yeah, it has a very interesting history. This is called the geology of a moment. I left something inside a scream, returned to the scene of the fire, now petrified in slow muteness, a seeping cave that crept down the wallows of my throat, a cave painting like a pot boiler villain tracked me with its eyes. Someone got the bright idea of taking animals down from the walls and placing them carefully below the skin in needlework wonderments. Undeterred, I tried to blend in on the forearm of the horseman who galloped around our house, waving a torch that bore his countenance of curls and cries. It was a lot to take in, and someone was bound to explode in semantics, overdose in recalcitrant symbols. Mayhem eschewed, I crawled into the deepest of basements, pressed in by imagination's limits. All I wanted was to see the inner sanctuary of my scream so I could go on in a clear understanding of others, how quiet it was here outside the spears from history's burning skies. Oh yes, there you are. So now for something, um, as they say, completely different or a uh, different geography, let's say. Um, here's a poem from my first collection, Jabbering with Bing Bong, and it um, starts in Surrey and it takes us to Vancouver, shifting through small talk. I never understood sitting in silence next to a stranger. Even as a kid on the bus, I wanted to strike up conversation as easily as a match lights a cigarette, inhaled imaginary quips, exhaled and choked, tongue-tied on the way to Guilford Mall or Surrey Place. I had to wait through 20 years in a classroom enforcing the friendly rules of conversation to finally find myself comfortable inside chit chat on my bike to work, to turn to someone at a red light and talk about her bell or his panniers or our sky, our bike paths, our gear in the rain. I'm gonna be reading from um, a number of different books. And um, as Pinder mentioned in um, my introduction, I have a number of chat books and chat books are small books of poetry. Here's, um, a chat book from Frog Hollow Press. And I wrote this um, three years ago, and it was um, the first winter here in the West End and just exploring Stanley Park and um, finding a little island in Lost Lagoon, an islet in Lost Lagoon. And this is called An Eyelid is the First Eclipse. And it's written to Shauna. Your eyes are hummingbird bodies held in place on the thought of wings. When the sun comes out, I go out too in search of some tree that nested your start. Between the lentils of a cherry blossom, a transistor radio antenna shoots up, picks up new wave from the static of your hair in the 80s. Further down the path, Cords of bark flow down a trunk like rough housing eddies of the Saskatchewan River in a flooding spring. But it's on an islet in Lost Lagoon where I witness a beaver felled oak diving into its reflection. Shavings from its old base thumb rides from clouds who oversaw your flitting across prairies to some iridescent risk takings across a continent. And I am gonna read some poems from Hearts Amok. And um, this is one I've read a lot, so I apologize if you've, if you've heard it more than twice, but um, I'll try to do something different in, in, a, in reading it. Apologia from Hoboken Christendom. If my metaphors unmake her allegorical gusto, gambling mouth, Glasses glinting hide the sun. Sword swung questions, somersault quests, tongue that probes teeth or truth. If she fails to stroll before you, 
glaze mescal tinted subtleties, grow blueberries from abandoned moats, craft sites for queens and gunsels, transmogrify your hands to maps, mosey off of own accord. You can blame my sing song spatchcock, my bindle stick stock of words, my tin ear for heating metallurgy of the dead. Blame my wing ding displays of old flames, my possum water eyes, my cloudily enraptured brains, for I wandered lonely as a clod, a knight of the road, took my solarettes off at the trash can blaze, and I swear, she's in a note above odds, bodkins, and train whistles, in a song sustained around the jackalope roast, until infinity flatlines her throat. And, well, you know what? The next poem <laughs> in the collection is, um, oh gosh, there's, I try to squeeze everything into every poem. So a lot of poems don't make it out into the world, obviously. Um, occasionally, I manage um, with the help of um, a lot of editors and I, um, other eyes to kind of squeeze many things into a poem that um, does make it out into the world. And this one, um, it's called a worshipful deriding of flim flam. And I've got some uh, hobo slang mixed in with some chivalric um, diction and um, terms. And it's set in Surrey, BC, but it's also thinking about um, colonialism and um, Surrey, um, another Surrey. A worshipful deriding of flim flam. Midway along our King George journey, I nodded off in a claggy corner of the bus, bum-rushed into a world wondrous strange, a land of scrap metal mayhem for a throat-clearing escutcheon scraper and a griffin grappling a horned rabbit at Wally's corner. My gaze gathered up the side of the road, seeking hobo glyphs of a single woman. I swooned at the image merely in mind, and my heart leapt out as a vulpa dinka. It hopped extra high upon its pheasant wings, bounded down hard on its antlers shadows, bolted off to I know not where. I sang in a fusion of con and pro whilst tracking myself into a forest named Before Thou Lovest Thou Must. After heartless hours, I came upon a camp of ex-evangelicals extracting theological thorns from their hides. They spoke of brain pan rushing, washing, mindset rust, how they'd swallowed so much of the corpus of Christ, their bellies now bloated in disbelief. Awkwardly begast, my insides glittered in fool's gold too, love lustered in screeds, weaned as I was on post-Mennonite ballyhoo, chasing go go goosebump moments around at Johnson Heights Evangelical, where an angel with a gilt-edged sword severed my sight. I spack of how dimpled hallelujahs danced around my head, and I would give chase. My heart hopped, sniffed at renditions of sexy righteousness, then under hard scrabble guilt, I'd face plant. After a gloss of faith, I forever more shilly-shallied twixt hosannas and holy shits like a gambling lamb along long hunger lane. After a fortnight, I bid this company of unborn again tramps adieu, walked my old lovelorn suburb Bopia past the smack glimmer castle of Guilford towards the skateboards of Clover Bale. That funny heart highballed past and I ran. It dove into a drain at the basement of my childhood. Abandon all mope ye who enter, croon the darkness. Loosed in translation, the uprooted pipes of yore shall crumple done in your fist to flower through your fingers. This will be your torch to her truth, and forbearance shall make your cardinal points to one the other. Um, so Hartzamach is um, rethinking um, romantic love through the traditions of um, chivalry and um, the weight of um, patriarchy and thinking about how love is kind of um, shaped by these other forces that are often unquestioned or maybe they are being questioned a lot more today through poetry, um, thankfully. This is called The Architecture of a Rock. Loneliness is a boulder at the bottom of ye old soul, graffitied upon 
by know-nothing punk fears, garlanded by cross-eyed tourists from the land of self-help, shunned by bum, bum moments, a backdrop for a Punch and Judy show. Blow out the candle casting these shadows and let the darkness hold the glum Goliath's weight. Forgive yourself within its black puzzlements. Try on its strength for size, wrap up in resilience. The sun will rise inside you in a ringed chorus of singeing, dying angels. Old depots of myth will be torn down following this transmission. Broken stones will pave a way wider than the old horizons. And this last poem that I will read is called The Last First Date. You rode in with a horizon falling behind like a dumpled parachute. Your smile landed. Our tires treaded close to each other. Two giant birds bequested our conversation with overarching attention. The sun glamored in. We clicked our helmet straps into place, cycled to whiskey. From there, we dabbled deep in chemistry. We'd crossed paths over the past 20 years. I bought earrings from you at Dream. You saw a short I acted in at the blinding light. Your heart had moved you to Mexico, Madrid, and then LA, but these weren't failures. We learn each time, you said, through alchemizing exactitude. We sat on art made of metal. You farted, le cul de foudre. Um, translation, um, a st strike of thunder, um, thunderclap. All right, thank you so much. Um, that's it, that's me. Great, thank you so much, Kevin. Those were wonderful poems. Um, really appreciate it. Um, our next reader up is Isabella Wang. Isabella is the author of two poetry collections on forgetting a language by Baseline Press in 2019 and Pebble Swing, which is forthcoming from Nightwood Editions in 2021. Her poetry and prose have appeared in over 30 literary journals and are forthcoming in four anthologies. She is the editor for issue 44.2 of Room Magazine. And um, you are a very, very busy human being with the literature. So here you go, Isabel. Thank you so much, Vinder, for that. And um, thank you, Kevin, for, it's always so nice to hear you read. And thank you everyone for um, inviting me into this space. I am, um, I'm very um, honored to be joining you um, in this Zoom space this evening. And um, I am coming to you from the unceded, never surrendered territories of the Suela Tooth peoples. And as Kevin did, I'm going to begin with a poem that Fender had so generously selected for Canadian literature. And what I think what I'm going to do is go kind of a bit broader and then go personal and end on a relatively high note. Hindsight. The decades interlude leaves us in suspense before the final act falls. Spring goes on without us. The caterpillars, ripe out of their cocoons, are eating our misery in weight and growing too thin for the tendency of the wind carried with their wings by flight. From behind private apartment walls, basement suites, the cadence of children's footsteps pass from May, June, July. It's getting harder to believe this month that God doesn't exist when I have so much still to ask for. Can't tell in this night where we end and the universe begins. I print out a picture of the sky into a poem for her. So dark, its edges disappear fall at the bottom of the inlet. It will be months before Lao Lao receives it. The woman writing to us in quarantine will have run out of pages. Thank you for, to Catherine Mockler and all the wonderful editors who edited this anthology. Spawning grounds. One, sandcastle bucket. This fable I grew up hearing that told of a time when the sea swept to shore all of its fishes. From the bluefin tuna of Scarborough to the mackerels migrating off coast, and what's left of the wild sturgeon near Bresca, 
northern Italy, where the sinkholes formed, where they were met with obstructions, where the tide began to retreat, the fish cannot get back. Along one shore, a child came with a sandcastle bucket, grabbed the fish by the handfuls and carried them back where they were released back into the waters. All this time, a bystander watched. They asked the child, why bother? There are so many of them. To this, the child replied, hurry, at least I'm doing something. Hurry, the next time the sea turns again, there'll be no more fish left to pick up. Listen, a plastic bag pirouettes on the road. Watch how it heaves and falls in the air, clear as diatoms, like jellyfish in the water. Formation driven by the motor of vehicles pumping 250 miles per hour. The wind blowing east, and no one picks it up. 25 plastic cups, a nylon sack, and two flip-flops are not enough for conservation researchers to determine the cause of death. The sperm whale was too well decayed. A carcass washed ashore at a southeast Suela Lucy provincial park. A signal, as villagers read, an innuendo seemingly to invite the words, come, butcher me. So they do. Three, shoreline. 60 million cigarette butts currently clogging our oceans, but we don't think of the watershed as a massive ashtray. More than plastic water bottles, more than straws, dislodged caps, and unlike plastic, filters can't be picked up. What's biodegradable disintegrates. What's disintegrated carries into rivers by rain, arsenic, nicotine, lead into oceans by waves our ecosystem into waterways, making a return back to our bodies. Four, spawning grounds. A female salmon by intuition returns to her prenatal stream carrying the weight of up to 3000 eggs. These she will climb to deposit in the hollows of gravel and sediment above falls, packed between freshwater riverbeds but to be met along the way by the dam, a muskrat falls of Labrador, the Kiasic Dam on the Nelson River, 93 square kilometers of hydro across boreal lands, snow forests liquefied, where a common spawning ground resides for the wild fish being met with the Sipe Sea Dam through BC, 128 kilometers of rivers flooded, the Peace River, a reservoir, an indigenous burial ground and home to 100 endangered species. In the south, 76 killer whales left on the brink of extinction. We erect hydro dams and rear fish in hatcheries away from na their natural habitat, bring wildlife back into nature, nature back into industrialization. This is what we call rewilding. The bare necessities of hatcheries strengthened through genetic engineering, forced interbreeding, but fish that rely on muscle memory year after year are the ones we see failing to return. Now, initially, I had planned a more, I don't know, I had planned another poem with changing directions. I felt um, as I was listening to um, Kevin's poetry, and I felt, as I felt the energy coming from everyone in this space and everyone in the audience, I thought instead of going in a more personal direction, I would go in the poetics of response. And so as I'm working on the last part of my manuscript right now, um, I'm start, I've written a series of poems um, in response to Phyllis Webb and her gazelles and anti-gazelles. And so this is the only part of the book that hasn't been really published or like shown to anybody. And so it's kind of a surprise and I'm glad that I can read it to all of you tonight. Gazelle for Phyllis Webb. I didn't know the poet then. A friend back from South Spring Island told me she dropped off some books to Phyllis Webb. Phyllis, do you feel the world transforming? 
this era of digital uniformity, pig human hybridity. In some parts of the world, they're breeding monkeys with two heads, one kitten whisker in a vault somewhere. I have forgotten the combination. How else to respond but to write as web? I open a new deck of index cards, blue, pink, yellow. Phyllis, do you, did you write them on the front side or the back? 62 couplets at sundown and 62 variations of the same couplet. The last rainfall till September. I get out of the rose garden to tend to a less spiky bed of thorns. The day hasn't got enough hours for all the poems to greet the sun, I assume. The black bush, the blackberry bush hides in a throng of blackbirds. The shovel breaks for a midday beer. Rain falls in September, fall falling. I spent all morning trying to sound out wah with a single intake of breath. A line breaks off and reconnects, or it breaks off indefinitely. Phyllis, I poured myself, the sun, and myself to you. I needn't a cassette player in this day and age, Phyllis, except to hear you. And this last one is for John Thompson. Thompson, I catch a great big fish for you, the trout as unresponsive as stone. I know you know, poetry isn't just in the song of the grieving. So you're still here, the sky, the stove. You've left me with no good recipe to follow. When the days grow cold, I'll be responsible for lighting my own poem, grove, trees. After Galib, I write an homage to all the woman poets I know. Now, a gazo from me. Springtime gazals. The color of plum blossoms taints my dreams. Light turns the wallpaper. Time falls in gradients down the hourglass. Click, clock, click, clock. The mechanic heartbeat of a petal falling. In my dreams, the deceased shadow of a country laid to rest. I, Isabella, was born to a cradle full of tempest rains. The white flower in blooms. The rhododendron, an explosion of blooms where a dog peed last winter, pink before, now blue. A parcel arrives wrapped in blue flax paper with the word coda. The silhouette of a bird shudders, then falls from behind closed shutters. Souvenir from my mother's trip to Africa, seven ivory elephant figurines. Tell me, does it hurt the ground more or the tree if you're to extract it by its roots? Three, again today, someone has asked me where I'm from. I am of this earth. My mother's womb, I say. Plum blossoms don't fall on a late Sunday morning. It's spring clearing. Each day I aspire to be more like water the kind that can be reached into and still flow. A harmonic peg sounding, a bass guitar left out in the rain. I leave an armchair out in the back alleyway. Then I leave myself out. We wait for dusk to fall, like driftwood waiting to be softened by the rain. Four. Thin scrolls of rice paper placed before me, a topography of Asia. I practice blotching my first ink characters in Chinese, turning ripples into tears. 
a map disintegrates with a stroke of a fine horsehair brush. A holy place, the tombed basilica of Shoshan, where I looked with my father for the last time. Beyond the one-way curvature of a railway track, I am chugging out of China. Only a plum blossom emerges, the reified outlines of a country I once called home. Twindling candle, taking flame. The plum blossoms are burning. Light remains in the closed shutters of my eyelids. Autumn sunshine pulls through the rims of a glass mug. A robin appears from the last sketch of a retracting spring. Here it's morning, not where she is. My grandmother is dying and I am in full blooms. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Isabella. That was a beautiful reading, quite moving. Um, so our next, uh, next poet is um, a Governor General Award winner, as well as serving uh, as the first parliamentary poet for Canada. Um, over 60 years of poetry, um, I consider him an icon in the literary community. Uh, BC poet Fred Waugh's most recent project is Music at the Heart of Thinking, Improvisations 1 to 170, published by Town Books in 2020. He also recently, in collaboration with Rita Wong, uh, worked on a, uh, uh, an extended piece called Columbia River, Beholding a Poem as Lord of the River. He is also the author of High Muckamuck and Playing Chinese, an interactive poem, which is available online. He lives in Vancouver and on Kootenai Lake. Please welcome Fred Wong. Thanks, Binder. 60 years, eh? I thought 60 years ago today, I may have been reading it uh, at UBC. But anyway, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read from uh, just two poems tonight. I'm going to read uh, uh, one long poem from uh, Music at the Heart of Thinking and then the poem that Pin Pinder chose for Canadian literature. And uh, I'd just like to thank Isabella for especially, uh, you know, getting that wah uh, breath going out of, out of Phyllis's uh, gozzles. And thanks, Kevin, to hear, it's so nice to hear you read. And I'm looking forward to hearing Jillian for the first time tonight. Anyway, this is a, a Music of the Heart of Thinking is a series of improvisations. And this is the last poem in the book. And it was written um, for a project in Quebec, uh, which, because it got stopped by COVID hasn't been produced, but it was a, a kind of audio video uh, uh, mashup project. Anyway, it's called Presence and it's based, uh, it's re a response to a piece of uh, sound art by uh, Magali Baban. About that smoke around your neck, about the invitation you expect to be delivered to your door, the one that creaks, that can't be locked and opens where the rabbit plague began and mythology inherited another story of discovery with a monkey in it leaping all over the violence and the jams of boundary where we had been trying to live a year or two and then set sail for El Dorado westward, even though the smoke was heavy in Oregon and British Columbia, obliged then to wait until mid afternoon in the old Atlantic time somewhere in the Pacific. This was also the rule in that hemisphere where the discipline of the anecdote waited for the ending in the music or the hum of the electric light rigidly enforced in the silent middle voice because the, low, because the law of halves looks on both sides of the imaginary circle around the earth, which never stops polishing and sweetening the celestial sphere. No crack, no opening of any sort, but very bright where medicines no longer have any helpful effect. So there it was in the pattern of, of the cigar metaphor, storified just like from the days of the Canadian remittance man, just like the circle waits for the check at the month's end, just as the tiny brain gets shipped or shopped around the world, at least the one we read about and take for proof there's no escape from this equator of thought and appearance. For example, at noon, there's lunch at the great Meridian and there is waiting, waiting for the chalk line of recognition, even though I have to approach it at a long slant. I would rather see it than any other thing in the world, girdle the doldrums, even bring it back to Lou Welch's wobbly rock and that charcoal border we talked about, 
Are these the stamps for the final envelope, a condition of things findable elsewhere in the tricky slant of echo repeating as an augmented forth forwards, backwards, plus minus stretched out across the ocean, which the sailor described to the young girl as a sluggish 20 degree blue ribbon through which the, slip, through which the ship slows down as it climbs up the bulge at the center of the planet, even told her that one must shave when crossing the equator for this first time. But he didn't tell her about Neptune's intervention into our own solar system of facts. E.g. this morning, we are in the night of time, which will last far longer than day, and tomorrow we'll be close to the center of our imagination, and then have to drop out a day, never knowing how much time remains, until we get to fade out in the coda until we get to fade out in the coda, forget about the equinox thoughts of this kind or always tomorrow, along about the moment we cross over the meridian, or at least invent that mo movement in order to find the honesty of history. Who can remember the citizen of our own big sky dipper used to be called Great Bear until it became the property of the United States trying to maga the universe, but no more talk of riots having crossed the celestial boundary. Now the Southern Cross will need a sky all to itself. So saith Sam Clemens. I would not change the Southern Cross to the Southern Coffin. I would change it to the Southern Kite, for up there in the general emptiness is the proper home of a kite, but not for coffins and crosses and dippers. Beneath the Magellanic clouds lies the bellbird of recognition ringing out, ringing out at short intervals from behind the constant whooshing of a deep wind, avoiding the miscalculation of overdensity where should we be for solace within this perfect fiction? The withering heat from the Northeast brings on stupendous drought, tracking its own thread of dementia through the doldrums under a constant ringing of each note in the augmented interval of Krakatoa's equatorial smoke stream, smoke stream or westward river of Indonesian exhaust or Quito's breathless haze chased into the hillsides smoldering in Sumatra now that the Amazon's part of the desire for new news burning at the hemline where presence is where it should be, right in the middle if the map has no beginning, just the skirt of our globe dressed up for the plan of our violence. If the plan is the body moved by those clouds of Brazilian smoke, then each of the presidentes drift to the equator's inner chamber where doubloons cast in silicon dress their greedy skin, each cold layer embossed with magnetic poetry under a Star Wars letterhead and the incessant sonic booms of natural resources pave the way for the next cricket farm while the bells keep ringing and the confessional curtain rustles not revealing its dark secrets, but our knees are getting sore, our penitents don't help. While standing in the doorway, you could oil the creaking hinges with dinosaur memory or that little yellow sticky on the fridge door reminding us of the same song every day, deep time looms out, looms out there. Or <clears throat> every time, every day, deep time looms out there or wrinkles in that thread through the middle kingdom of celestial garbage and a showy imperfection and asphalt of the imagination, always trying to economize the truth as another treasure island. Let's confess and live under the bridge since distance is presence. Damn it, where is my copy of America a Prophecy? Is this a chain of memory that resurrects Albion's cliffs? Is this where I'm supposed to meet you? Is this the door that's never locked? Is this the creek where Loki died? Is this river just the smoke around my neck? And if so, no, why not make the smoke a door? So that was a long kind of uh, riff or ramble on, uh, on, on the equator, <laughs> I guess, on the middle, being in the middle. Uh, the other poem I'm going to read is a poem called uh, Basalt or Basalt uh, that uh, I think uh, is one of the poems that uh, uh, Pinder chose to put in, I think it's going to be published in the magazine. Basalt. Between the raw lakes, between the creeks, the volcanic province builds difference into silence, buzzing the ravines with the great wall of thought so that even the currents of air sculpt the shape the water makes, holds all its early information in stones and sound of water over creek stone, lava done the way flow talks that little hidden fender of itself to measure whatever's in the way, not a mistake, just a fissure, an isolated vent where the water will find around the rocks intentional waves, an invert floor of floating worlds, another culvert for an old, old story, the one that feels the river one way and the other way downstream basalt news, the Pasco Basin middle voice still ebbs and speaks, and there are cracks. Igneous is everything. Two. Twin 
basalt Dimchin masks. One looks in and back, and the other looks out and forwards. I asked her about her alarm buddy, an alarm buzzer they've, they're given to wear around their necks for emergencies. She seems to have misplaced it. So we comb through her apartment. She goes to the dresser in her bedroom and opens a shallow drawer filled with little things, some jewelry, pins and strings and buttons and cases and little boxes and memorabilia from 93 years of a life. She stands looking into that drawer and shuffling through it continually for a long time, maybe 10 to 15 minutes before I go up to her and ask her what she's looking for. She doesn't know, says, there's sure a lot of junk in here and keeps picking up items, fondling, continually sifting, looking, but not looking. How to look when you don't know what you're looking for? Is she looking inward or backwards or outwards? Not forwards, but for words. Her dementia here is an act of some kind of trance. She is in fact in a trance. And that's for my mother. It's, uh, it would have been her 104th birthday today. So there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fred. That was uh, an amazing reading. Certainly uh, expansive and such great movement of poetic language that you shared with us. Thank you so much. So the next reader is uh, Jillian Christmas. Jillian Christmas is a queer Afro-Caribbean writer living on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam people. She has won numerous poetry titles, no notably breaking ground as the first Canadian to perform on the final stage of the Women of the World Poetry Slam. Jillian has presented poetry and theory in a multitude of venues she is the author of The Gospel of Breaking by Arsenal Pulp Press 2020. Please welcome Gillian Christmas. Hello, and thank you, Premier. Thank you um, to all of the organizers for bringing us together uh, across these digital airwaves. That's how it works, right? Digital airwaves, anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, I am also uh, reading and joining you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people. Um, and I think I want to just take a moment, uh, take the opportunity to acknowledge um, the actions that are happening across Turtle Island right now, uh, led by Indigenous um, leaders who um, I hope we can listen to and um, uh, follow the guidance uh, that they are graciously and generously offering um, so that we can all get out of this place alive. Um, so with that, I'm going to read one of uh, a newer piece, one that was um, included in this anthology, Monday was a simpler time, reflections on a pandemic, and it was um, collected by the Sunshine Coast Festival of Literary Arts. Um, this piece is entitled, It Has To. My witch mama tells me that I need to let go of my need for suffering. Not me personally, but us, everyone. And I think it's such a bold statement to make in a year when even our suffering is quarantined, our deepest hurts sequestered. A line on the sidewalk reminding us apart. Two circles on the grass in a park. So many strangers pass, and each feels familiar enough to tell us about the correctness of our distance. And it doesn't matter that I am crying so hard I cannot breathe, or that another one of us is dead in the streets with everybody's mama watching and screaming and grieving the perfect distance apart. Some stranger says, yes, that's just right. No touching now. And a smile that asks, do you understand children? This is how it has to be. And it doesn't matter that I want to cradle everyone I love, that there is already too much distance for anyone to understand this pain of forever losing 
our children becoming ancestors before their grandparents' eyes. A magic trick of babies turning into chalked streets and sirens evaporating into the stench of pepper spray. I bounced off the walls of my own apartment, a rubber bullet without a soft home of flesh to hold it. I screamed in solitude and everybody heard me, but it didn't matter enough to be held, to be made like water in the palm of some sure hands, to be free, to move toward each other, to run my skin between the fingers of some friend, mother, lover, to be healed by each other. She tells me through the screen, me and the other hundred or so people watching from our homes, thirsty for the comfort and the care a mama can offer. She tells us again, let it go. And don't forget that you are golden. And now I am crying again, moving my eyes and my fingers like new, gently over each hand holding me. Each memory floods toward me, a gathering of memories pooling into the shape of a funeral and a song and a tender touch on the back of my hand and a long look and a smile. And do you understand, child, this is just the way it has to be. Um, okay, uh, this next one that I'm going to read is entitled, Each of the Spirits, Each of Them Come. When dark falls, mommy begins to tell me shadow stories. Her lips part slow and the words stumble out in a kind of drawl. Her eyes are heavy with remembering and I know that she is only telling me the small pieces, the ones I am ready to hold. Twice while I am sitting in this blue and darkening light, I hear her say it. In the midst of life, we are in death. A truth she has become accustomed to telling. The cars pass on the road outside her window and each casts a strange new light, a long, leaning specter. She remembers for me the dead who have come to her like the living, the three women, relatives of her father, come to say hello, stood on the porch and never entered the house. The boy she used to feed good in Charlottesville, dead from the sugar, come to stand in her kitchen hungry and thirsty again, but refusing any drink that would do him more harm. And once, even her own brother, walking up the big hill, asking her for cool water, each of the spirits, each of them come. Each of the spirits more well than when they were living. Canes and age and ailments left beyond the veil. She feeds them all in life and after. Lays fresh rice at her table so that their long journeys will be good. I tell her that I do the same. Almonds and honey on my altar at home and in the bundle I carry. Gifts for the passing and the past. I think of the small drink for an old friend, slowly emptying itself on my balcony oceans away. I think of the poet who spoke of the insatiable hunger of those who arrived on Turtle Island, believing that everything was for the taking, but lacking the basic knowledge to feed their own ghosts. Lying in bed, surrounded, my belly whines and grumbles out a complaint, but I am not hungry enough to rise. All of my ghosts, sated and slipping into their slumbers, carried careful into the quiet blue night. Um, that piece kind of mentions an, uh, one other poet and um, that poet that I'm speaking of in that piece is uh, Philip Kevin Paul, who uh, is a wonderful poet on the Sunshine Coast. 
Um, and I just mentioned it because I wanted to say thank you um, to um, the journal, to Isabella, um, to Kevin, um, and to Fred for being in this gathering together. Um, it feels so wonderful to be in conversation <laughs> and to be, um, yeah, in community with other writers, especially right now. So uh, yeah, thank you for being in this lineage together. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna utilize my friend here, Marshmallow, um, to offer you this next piece. remembers herself, a little girl, turned away from a birthday pool party. Mama remembers herself, a little girl, turned away. Before we fly from Trinidad to the small island, we drive up the hill to stay in the big hotel. Now newly renovated, it has stood on the same perch for the better part of a century. Mama remembers herself, a little girl, turned away from a birthday pool party because this big North American hotel didn't yet let brown girls bathe themselves in full sunlight. Somehow scared the world would be hypnotized by the shine. Probably even mama didn't know she was a diamond in a pool of glass, the way they treated her. When we reached the hotel, nearly 50 years later, standing new and shiny in the same cursed spot, we learn that the pool is the last piece of renovation. It will not reopen until after we leave. Today, I saw a small blonde haired girl drift back and forth. Impossibly buoyant child carried upward atop a weightlessness so deep and vast that she could not touch her feet to the bottom. The big blue stretched out around her, clean white tile framing the scene in its perimeter. Mama was a little girl once. Once I was two. Maybe always will be someplace. After hours of travel, I pull the tiny computer from my pocket. I each blue image pouring from its screen. Every one erupting new color. Some unknown and yet beloved brown face smiling after another. A newsreel of necessary medicine. Dancing dark girl pops her shoulder in my direction. Mean mugs until the camera looks away. Dark skinned boy and his father blow each other kisses with a tenderness that quenches my dreams. The remedy is loving each other harder, loving these brown bodies more than water and deeper still. Mama remembers herself. Mama remembers herself. Mama remembers.
And I think I'm going to leave it right there. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Wow, thank you so much. That was an amazing reading, Jillian. I've read that last poem that you've, uh, you sang. Um, uh, I've read it a few times. It's just a moving poem. It's beautiful. So we're, um, we're at the end of our reading section and we are now ready to go into uh, some Q and A's and um, we're certainly encouraging the um, audience members to um, uh, put the questions in the chat box so that Brendan can kind of bring them forward. But I, I wanted to ask a question or I wanted to explore something and that is uh, the emergence of social justice work in the poetry landscape. What is the role of the poet in social justice work? And does the words that we use as poets have resonance and, and have um, an audience that uh, will listen and will change? Well, I'll, yeah, off, I'll offer a little bit of a, a sense of that. Uh, my sense of, of uh, not so much social justice itself, but the role of, uh, at least as I see it in for poetry, uh, is to discover, look, look for language, look for language that uh, will also be yours, will be ours. So that's, uh, language is a social uh, phenomenon. Language is a social material. So I think as writers, we, uh, we, are, we have the uh, great privilege of being right in the face of, of, uh, of some of the tools that, uh, that will help us to, you know, gather up some, you know, reasonable sense of social justice. Of course, that's always uh, it's always rife and it's always very um, uh, organic and, and active and, and contradictory and and uh, ambiv ambivalent and so forth. But uh, at least I feel that that's a good place to be. It feels comfortable to be in language. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. That definitely resonates with me, Fred. And um, yeah, I mean, oh gosh, I don't know what people do in times like this if they don't have like a creative outlet to put <laughs> all of these feelings into. I hope that everyone out there is like doing something with all of these feelings. Um, but yeah, poetry um, definitely feels to me uh, like a way of marking uh, these moments that we go through together that we travel through in all of this um a way of capturing the nuance of it um and i think maybe marking it in history so that um in the context of social justice we do have a measure you know we have um some voice from the people to speak to what the conditions are what they could be imagining beyond and also like reflecting on what um what injustice has happened and is happening um, I think it's a, a part of the engine that moves us forward uh, as a society, you know, not just poets and writers, but artists um, who can speak to uh, what the times are and what we can imagine them to be in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Jillian. I think Isabella, you wanted to have a... Yeah, I have the academic classroom thing ingrained in me, so I will always raise my hand. <laughs> but um, I wanted to um, read a little bit from um, Lindsay Freeman quoting um, mm. Fred Moten and Dubois and Three Minds that I'm just completely like inspired by. But um, Freeman writes, I almost leapt out of my chair when I heard Fred Moten describe his method of critical poetry as the mode of sociology that is in turn only achievable by way of and as an expression of an active experimental poetics. Um, so, um, and then she writes, um, Moton reverses Dubois even as he thinks with him in order to create critical poetry and as a form of sociology that hesitates, breathes and takes the time it needs to get close. And, you know, I'm thinking about um, a poem that I recently read translated by um, um, the translated works of a Chinese author where he was writing poetry about the conditions of migrant workers in China and the labor laborers 
and thinking of myself, my most recent project. I'm looking to um, different kinds of political protests and other kinds of gatherings and masses and um, voicing and expression as a kind of nonviolent um, resistance. And you know, in other in other mediums, I think there is a need for essays, for creative essays, for you know other forms um, of criticism. But at the same time, I think what poetry does so powerfully is not only examine some of the um, some of the ideas and bases, kind of grounding these moments, but also drawing out the um, what is immensely emotional. And you know, poetry has the ability to also um, allow us to look at the emotional side of these kind of, you know, historical or political moments. And that's what I think it's really important. Thank you, Isabella. Kevin. <laughs> I'll put my hand up too. Just to, um, in, just, in solidarity. Just, <laughs> Um, yeah, the word that um, in um, Jillian, the word that stu stood out for me, um, reflection, you, you used the word reflect. And for me, it feels like reflection is, um, well, poetry is so suited to reflection and a place to pause and think about language and what language does. And certainly it's social. And um, the optimist in me wants to believe that if, if anybody kind of pauses and stops and really looks at the world, um, which is kind of what a poem is, um, they'll, you know, there'll be kind of um, some sort of awareness and some sort of sharing of um, our interactions with one another and then an, an awareness of systems of injustice. Um, that's the optimist in me that you know poetry can do that I mean of course there's there being war poems and poems that have celebrated all sorts of horrible things but those kind of they move forward quite quickly and that again thinking about reflecting and slowing down and pausing um, I don't know it seems to me that um, poems are perfectly positioned for that also they are places for you know filled with these surprises and they're also helping us to think differently, I think um, outside of the fixed um, ideological kind of um, garbage that we are often fed. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, I, I find um, at least in, in the writing that I also engage in, I'm constantly um, struggling with this notion of being political um, and and where my, my voice lies in terms of being an observer and a, and a person committed to social justice work through poetry, uh, but also wanting to also be known for the writing itself and the, and the craft of writing. That's something that I always kind of struggle with, those two oscillating points in the, um, in the life of writing. But I'm going to check in with Brendan here and uh, see if we have some questions from the audience. Thanks, Pinder. Yep. Um, we do, we, we have a question from Harry. Um, I have a question of my own I'd like to ask him, but I would like to remind um, everyone to please, if you have questions, to take them into the chat so we can bring them to the speakers. But Harry Wong, um, ask kind of a, a broad question, um, just about ideas that, um, he says some sentiments or some ideas just seem right in sequence and in their content. And he, he's asking for examples of, of particular ideas, um, perhaps in some of the poems you, you've read um, tonight, uh, of ideas that troubled you the most, or perhaps came so perfectly together, all together for you. So um, it, it's quite a broad question and, and one that maybe you could take up it in, in any any way you'd like. Yeah, I actually think perfect ideas are the worst <laughs> because you know they're the lines that's you know so beautiful that you're so attached to that came you know so automatically to you that they sound they're just like perfect and so you can't really throw them out. 
but you know much of the work like 95 to 99 percent of the work of poetry itself is not you know if not like I don't know if not normal is natural is the word but it takes you know effort and it takes a lot of work and revisions and so when you have those kind of lines that you kind of attach to at least for me a lot of the time they don't fit anywhere and it's often you know I sit with a line for months until they actually get a home somewhere and a lot of my Gaza project is like that I you know I think Phyllis Webb um her book is um a series of Gaza that's around 70 pages long and in her preface talked about writing it over like the course of like one um fall and for me I've been working on um the 13 poems in response to her for the past two years and I'm very proud of that work and I like taking the work um time for that but what I'm saying is um especially with that project there were just so many lines that I, wa I wanted to keep but I didn't know how to pair them with other stuff yeah, I thought, just while you're on Phyllis Webb there, Isabella, I just mentioned that uh, that poem I read, the basalt poem, it had the two uh, chimshin masts in it. That was that's an image from a um, or a, an idea, if you like, or a, a book that came out many many years ago called Images Stone B.C., uh, edited by Wilson Duff, who's a who uh, Phyllis Webb is, has also been involved with or talk, talked about. So that whole notion of the, those masks, uh, they're, if you ever get a chance to see these two, they're stone masks. One has the eyes looking out and the other mask has the eyes looking in. And they were uh, Simchen, uh, used for Simchen, uh a dance, as we assume. But uh, that whole notion of, um, uh, how to look at how to look when you're not when you don't know what to look for and and then of course that leads to uh, the whole question of memory and and the poem the poem is ostensibly aimed at my mother's dementia and and how that uh, becomes a a problem for uh, for looking <laughs> you know where where do you look when you when you're when the, when the, when you don't have any kind of um, uh, when you have nothing to look at. Anyway, so those kinds of things that, like that image of the images stone, the two, two, two uh, stone masks, I've been carrying around for years and I still, it's just a, a kind of trope or a, a, an image that I, I hang on to and uh, gee, there I, you know, it just sort of came in handy. <laughs> I don't know if this speaks to um, the question, but it, just that phrase, ideas that troubled you. Um, the poem um, that comes to mind when I, I think of ideas that are troubling, I have a poem in Hearts Amok that's called Cupid, the Duke of Trauma. And um, it begins in those textbook days, he aimed for the eye, a quiver to a quaking heart. Um, and just thinking about the violence of Cupid and thinking about um, as the, the figure in the Middle Ages, he would aim for the eye and somebody would be shot in the eye and there was this agony that went with it. And that um, seems to be a justification for a lot of horrible things that then followed. Um, and yet Cupid is this cute kind of pink little um, harmless kind of image. But when we look into the history of it, there's, there's a lot there's a lot more. And so it's just um, troubling to think about the origins of something that were, um, that were so violent and, um, and yet it's kind of just cleaned up a bit. That's one thing that troubles me. Uh, for me, that a lovely listening to everyone's answers, by the way. Um, I think I, I definitely relate to what Fred was saying about uh, those sort of pieces that you carry with you for a very long time until maybe they find uh, their right home somewhere. And, um, and I guess it kind of speaks to uh, what Isabella was saying as well about those perfect ideas that are hard to lose. And I often um, find myself like squirreling those, those lines away into uh, notebooks, the ones that 
feel so like juicy, but not quite right for this moment or this poem. Um, and maybe they end up being a title and a prompt for something different. But um, yeah, this piece that I uh, that I recited, um, uh, it's it's called they said we wouldn't need these life jackets on dry land. That's the piece about my mother uh, and the pool. And um, that one was, uh, I guess, like a hard piece to bring into the world uh, in that uh, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of traveling, a lot of asking for stories, a lot of, um, I, I guess you could call it research, but it felt like just um, interrogating my family stories and uh, going to the root of those. Um, and even then the piece didn't sort of like come together. It, there was a lot of um, sort of asking and drawing out of it. And it wasn't until I was at the Banff Center um, uh, seeing that image of, of Ease, um, the, the young girl in the pool moving in a way that felt so um, complicated in my, my family story. Um, yeah, that it all kind of uh, pieced together. So I think those ones that feel um, a little troubling or, or difficult to get out, I think maybe we have a longer journey with them. And um, yeah, and maybe in that longer journey, we learn a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, I was thinking of memory and how that also works in, in, in terms of poetry itself. And I just wonder, um, as we kind of look into our family histories, how important that that memory is in terms of the work that you find on the page. I wonder if you could talk about memory a little bit. If I may jump in, um, memory has kind of been my central obsession um, even before I started writing poetry. So thank God for poetry. So then I started doing something productive with that obsession. <laughs> and I just, um, there's so much I personally don't remember uh, um, around family stories that are quite horrific. Um, I was able to gain access to my dad's medical records from Riverview where he was, um, he was half a dozen times from the 1950s until 1982. And so I was able to read um, reports of his mental illness and read reports of what had happened um, around these blanks. And so for me, it's interesting. I'm interested in thinking about how we write around those blanks and how we write um, um, in, you know, through, um, through the unknown and how memory and forgetting kind of work um, in tandem with each other, how memory, uh, forgetting is sometimes a, a, an active um, thing. And um, yeah, um, and I lament, you know, not having an amazing memory. I think of James Joyce who kind of held up Nemo sign, the, the mother of the muses as like the ultimate muse. And he had, he was known for having this remarkable memory, though he really just was good at gossiping and getting a lot of good gossip out of other people through letters and maybe charming them. But um, it, it seems to me that memory is so central to writing and, um, and metaphor as holding those memories that we may not be conscious of. Um, yeah, those are some thoughts. I was thinking of uh, William Carlos Williams is, uh, I, I, I may be misquoting him here. I think he says um, uh, somewhere, uh, memory is a kind of accomplishment, a sort of renewal, and, and he goes on. And I like, I've always liked that sense of that when we come upon memory, it's not something that is sort of like dead out of the past or sort of, <laughs> You're, you're, it's, it's way back there somehow, but that it's a moment of renewal and uh, and a beginning. So it's kind of a kind of pick up from where you left off, or a pick up again, or 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 or, or injecting it with a, a a new life. It's interesting because I'm actually taking a sociology class on spaces of memory right now. And yet memory has always been both so fleeting and overwhelming for me that it's hard for me to really express anything around it. I often talk, compare my memories of the past and the memories that were passed down to me through um, family histories and stories 
as kind of a Chin a black and white Chinese new film that is silent, because my memory from the time from before I start from the time when I was still speaking Chinese has kind of reversed itself to an imaginary order with my loss of language. I've kind of either written over all the memories um, by translating them and the stories into an English version of it that I can understand and keep, or you know, I remember it through um, images with no words. But I'm actually um, writing, thinking about that and writing an essay about it with Guy Madden's film, My Winnipeg. And basically as a way of reconstructing his past and looking at his repressed memories, he hires actors and um, rents out the house that he grew up in in order to get a chance to look back on some of the things that happened in the past. And, but for some of us, right, we don't have metamonics, we don't have actors, we don't have a lot of language and stories left to um, find our way back. And in the film, he has this line, um, even people who have never imagined, who have never experienced snow can imagine what it's like to walk through it, i.e. you can follow the snow imprints and kind of track your way through. And, you know, there are some of us who lack the crystallized foundations of snow, but can still be inundated by, you know, memories of leaving an impression behind. Um, and it also, yeah, I, um, I found some gems in there and what you were saying, because I, I think uh, a lot about the ways in which sort of cultural memory are disrupted um, by colonialism and like, I think uh, a lot of my work is an attempt, my work, especially m my internal work around uh, family and story is around sort of reconstructing um, that uh, familial memory um, and trying to trace those steps that um, were intentionally um, cut off, you know? Uh, and yeah, I I mean, I think like anyone, I, I, I think memory is, um, is kind of fraught because I, I'm equally fascinated and, and drawn toward it and also suspicious of it. <laughs> and, um, you know, I find it a little bit troubling in that um, it's, it's a hard thing to grab onto and know for sure, even my own uh, recollections. I often find myself um, writing as a means of sort of securing what I know onto anchoring it to a page, you know? Um, and I, I know of moments where I've called up my mom to say like, is that what happened? Is that how you remember it happening? And I feel so comforted when it is the same way she remembers it happening. Um, but, you know, there's so many, uh, so many moments where that is not the case, uh, where we have different stories. Um, and I, I guess I'm thankful that I'm not an archivist, that I'm a poet and that <laughs> um, I get to sort of maneuver between um, what is uh, the the um, canon of reality and what is my uh, imagination and, mm -hmm. and experience. I think we're all archivists of personal um, uh, archives and as well as um, uh, state archives when we do want to interrogate further the colonial context of our lives. Uh, Jillian, I was struck by a line in uh, your first poem, beautiful poem, um, or I, I might be misquoting you, but you describe the sense of bouncing off the walls of your apartment like a rubber bullet. Um, and, you know, that, that, that sort of uh, infuriating sense of, of solitude that contrasts in that poem with um, a real sense of connection uh, with community across history, um, across generations. Um, and of course, that poem is addressing a very particular and ongoing history of, of anti-Black violence. Um, but this, this contrast of, of, um, of, of the frustration of solitude um, with the comfort of community that, that struck me in that poem. Um, and it, it made me think, you know, outside the poem a bit into the context of the current COVID pandemic, you know, where, you know, our sense of space and connection has transformed in many ways where we're at once more 
more easily connected through through uh, venues like this, uh, but also more physically distant. So just to, to take that that sort of kernel from the poem and expand out a bit. I'm wondering if perhaps anyone on the panel could comment or say a bit about um, what you know this last several months has meant for you as as poets in terms of your your practice, um, your sense of community, or even just what you're you're writing about. That piece means a lot to me because I feel like um, well, it was it's hard to put into words what this year has felt like and. Um, to me, um, one of the things that, that was sort of the call for that piece, I was listening to or reading something that uh, Hanif Willis uh, Abdurraqib wrote about um, Aretha Franklin. And, uh, you know, her funeral was this great big affair and everybody came out and, and sang and spoke and, uh, and it went for hours and hours. Um, and he was reflecting on um, the, the fact that um, one of the, the great reasons that so many people came out, not just because Aretha Franklin was this icon, was, but was also because Aretha had shown up to so many funerals um, in the Black community over decades and decades to honor people. Um, and it was just this idea of like the way that we mourn um, and how important it is for us to be together, uh, especially in the Black community. I thought back to 2016 and um, you know, this uh, rhythm of like um, black death that was just like pulsing um, through every moment in that year and, and, um, and what it meant to be able to collect and, and hold each other um, and, and how absent that has felt this year and, and, you know, what an impact that has had. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have been in this moment um, in this year, trying to find all of the ways that I can to, to cultivate some intimacy, um, to create some moments of grief, uh, collective grief that can be, have us held together, some moments of healing and, and magic um, uh, and rootedness. And yeah, it's, a, it's such a challenge, but they are there, they're alive. I, I have felt them, that's for certain, yeah. I sleep a lot. So therefore I dream a lot. Yeah, it's been weird. It's been hard. I miss everyone a lot. I'll say that much. I mean, you asked um, Brandon, like what it means to be a poet in the past couple of months. And, you know, for me, like I wasn't writing or anything. You know, it kind of meant having to move four times in the past, just the summer, and kind of mm -hmm. just getting everything together again. And what really, I think, what really like um, kept me grounded was knowing the fact that, you know, no matter, you know, it's okay not to write. You know, sometimes being a poet means going through periods of time where you're just simply living and experiencing life and not writing, but at the same time, you know, knowing that there is always a community of poets reading and writing and responding to each other's works, um, putting good work out there as all of you have shown tonight. And for me, that was very comforting to know. And, you know, it's a time where, you know, we are very distant and at the same time, Geographically, geographically collapsed because of Zoom. And, you know, I think, you know, just being reminded of the fact that there is a community out there still. Fact that, you know, even though, though Fender took the one poem about the pandemic I ever meant to write that was like 10 lines long, you know, Zadie Smith has a book out. Uh, yeah, being okay not, not to write at all because I couldn't even write a poem about not writing because I already wrote a poem about that like two years ago. And I don't think people want to read two poems about that. In my introduction, Pinder mentioned- <laughs> <laughs> In my introduction, Pinder mentioned that I have a class that I teach at VCC and this year it was online for the first time. And at first I was dreading um, teaching this class that I developed to be 
delivered in person that is people kind of touch things and move around and it's um the focus is embodiment and thinking about um putting as much of our sensorial um kinesthetic kind of experience into words and poems so i was like ah how will this um work online but in the end it, it was so i felt i feel so fortunate to have witnessed these strangers come together and they they bonded and they connected and it was so remarkable to see um isabella mentioned community well this micro community and these people that were really getting a lot out of reading some poems and talking about it and writing in response to these poems so um, for me this year the focus has been more on reading and teaching and thinking about teaching in in this um very different medium um, and you know acknowledging that you know it's not ideal of course but there are opportunities that we can kind of make our way through and um, and gosh I think people are quite um, kind of hungry for those connections and, um, so I just wanted to thank the poets I thank Fred Jillian Isabella Kevin for beautiful readings and for thought provoking poetry and ideas that uh, we can reflect on. Um, and I just want to thank again the Canadian Lit uh, Literature um, staff for putting this on. To read it, reiterate what Pinder said, um, thank you so much to the, the poet panelists for your wonderful readings and contributions and to all of you for attending this um, inaugural uh, venture of ours into the virtual realm of of poetry readings.